Eh, mi nombre es Carlos Vilalta, bienvenidos todos al bello estado de eh, Yucatán, aquí en Mérida. Eh, tenemos una mesa fascinante, eh, pa, pa, al menos para nosotros que somos geógrafos, y en mi caso voy a estar eh, conversando en español, pero mis colegas van a estar eh, presentando obviamente en sus idiomas, aunque no sea el caso de Laura, pero probablemente también en inglés. Y de nuevo, pues bienvenidos. Eh, las reglas del, eh, de la mesa o del panel, en esta ocasión es, tenemos varios presentadores, eh, tenemos tres presentaciones con cuatro speakers, eh, cada uno de ellos va a estar conversando aproximadamente 15 minutos, yo les voy a estar avisando every five minutes, three minutes, one minute, etc. Y luego abriremos una ronda de preguntas y respuestas, tengo entendido que les van a estar pasando unas notas en papel blanco, para que si quieren hacer algunas preguntas a quien en específico quieran hacerlas, eh, son muy bienvenidos. Eh, vamos a seguir el orden del programa para poner los, los presentadores y entonces en la primera presentación vamos a tener a Shane Johnson de UCL que nos va a presentar eh, el tema de el papel de la red vial en la formación del patrón delictivo. Welcome Shane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to break with convention, I'm going to stand and I might move around a bit as well, so I kind of apologize for that. Um, largely because I want to make the cameraman do some work. Um, it's been far too easy for them so far. Um, can I get the slides? Um, so I'm going to talk about what we've been doing on the role of the street network in crime pattern formation. Okay, and what you'll see when the slides appear is that a number of people have been involved um, in the work I'm going to be talking about. And what I'll do is I'll flash up their um, faces as we go through this, just so you get a sense of who's been involved um, in which piece of work. So I want to start by saying why we think street segments are important. And street segments, what I mean by this, is the stretch of road between any two intersections. And the reason we think they're important for analysis, rather than doing the usual area level analysis, is that it's at the street segment level that offenders decide where to commit offenses. It's also at the street segment level that police officers are deployed and deter crime. So we think the street segment better reflects the lived reality of where crimes take place. So what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes um, is talk about two empirical regularities that we've identified um, in our research. And I'll tie these two together in terms of the work we've been doing on crime prediction. So as many of you will know, crime is spatially clustered. I'll illustrate this with the slide you see in front of you. This is an analysis of crime patterns in a county in the United Kingdom, and it's a Lorenz curve that you're seeing in front of you. And the way to read this is to look at, we look at the most risky um, street segments, and if we look at the most risky that account for 20% of households, we can see what fraction of crime they account for. And you can see in this example, uh, for street segments, the most risky that account for 20% of households account for about 70% of crime. If we look at the area level analysis, which is the census areas in this case, we, see, we also see spatial concentration, but it's much less than in the case of the street segments. So to me, this suggests that the concentration at the street segment level is what drives area level patterns. And we see this pattern across many cities um, in the developed world, uh, in Canada, in America, the Netherlands, and so on. And recently, one of my students has conducted survey work in Nigeria, and it showed that we get exactly the same sorts of patterns um, in, that con in that context. So it would appear to be the case that these patterns are relatively ubiquitous, at least across those locations for which we've studied uh, these patterns. Now, another interesting thing, if you look at these patterns at the street segment level, is that we get what I refer to as sharp discontinuities in risk. So if you look at the, uh, the large map in, in front of you, you'll see um, street segments shaded according to crime risk. The red areas are those, or the red segments are those with the highest risk, yellow with the lowest. And we see some grouping of red segments and yellow segments to suggest that some areas are more risky than others. But if you focus instead on this sort of uh, blown out picture here, you can see that what we have is some high risk street segments immediately adjacent to those with little or no crime risk associated with them. And area level explanations for crime patterns can't explain this kind of formation. So we need to think differently. So two possible perspectives we can draw on. 
are Jane Jacobs' ideas about eyes on the street. This idea is that on street segments through which lots of people move, there'll be capable guardianship. So the ambient guardianship which is present through people moving through locations will deter crime. An alternative perspective is crime pattern theory. Here the idea is that all of us engage in routine activities. As a consequence of that, we move through particular spaces. And some spaces will have more movement than others. We build awareness of those locations. And in the case of offenders, it's in those awareness or activity spaces that they're most likely to commit crime. So according to Jacobs, the idea is that mo those street segments which are used the most will have less crime because of guardianship. In the case of crime pattern theory, we predict the opposite. Those street segments with more movement will have more crime on them because they'll feature in the collective awareness um, of offenders. So a number of studies have attempted um, to test these hypotheses. Um, the earlier studies tended to use smaller sample sizes and use statistical methods which weren't particularly robust. So we've conducted a series of studies recently using larger samples and, and kind of better statistical methods. So I'm going to talk through an example of that now. So the example I'm going to talk about is for the case study of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. We estimated movement potential throughout the street network, borrowing from techniques or using techniques from the mathematical field of graph theory. And I'll talk you through that in a moment. Just to give you an idea of the study area, this gives you a map um, of um, Birmingham. You'll see that there are half a million homes in the study area, about 50,000 street segments. We analyzed data for a four-year period. The areas that you see in front of you, those that are, are colored in, are the medium layer super output areas. So these are quite large areas. And the smaller areas nested within them are output areas, uh, according to the census. They have about 150 households in them. So these are small neighborhoods. And then we also, of course, have data on the street network that lies beneath them. So how do we analyze the street network? So the three um, graphs or images that you see in front of you, I'm going to go this way this time, show you, first of all, uh, a kind of Google map that you're familiar with. What we then do is we identify all the intersections on the, on the map. And these are the nodes in, in graph theory terms. <clears throat> we then connect them. Uh, with the street segments, and those are what we refer to edges um, in graph theory. So now we have um, a mathematical graph of the street network that we can subsequently analyze. If you could click play. Um, so we, to analyze a street network, we use a metric called between us. And this gives us an estimate of movement potential through the network. The way that we calculate between us is we look for every single possible journey through the network, from every origin to every destination. We calculate the shortest path from that origin to destination. Each time a street segment features in that shortest path, we add one to a counter, which indicates the frequency with which that street segment features in the shortest path through the network. Now, we can vary the kind of journeys we're talking about. So if we limit the radius or the distance um, of these origin to destinations, we can estimate pedestrian movement. So if we have short trips, these mimic pedestrian movements through the network. Or we can make them larger, so three kilometers or more in this case, and we're mimicking vehicular movement through the network. And there have been studies conducted to show that these provide good estimates of movement flows of people throughout the street network. So this is what we use um, in our empirical test. This just gives you um, a sense of what these um, road networks look like. So the graph or the map on the left shows you vehicular movement. The one on the right shows you how different it looks when we're uh, mimicking or modeling pedestrian movement through the network. So you can see that these two are different. Just to show you some descriptive statistics, the way to read this is this is the data for the whole study area across all street segments. On the x-axis, we have our metric of between us. So this is our estimated movement through street segments. On the y-axis, we have the burglary rate at street segments with those different movement potentials. What you see is a clear linear relationship between the two. So it seems to be the case that where movement potential is highest on street segments, you get higher burglary risk on those segments. Now, this is obviously just a descriptive analysis. So we use a more 
formal statistical model, which most of you will be delighted to hear I'm not going to talk through. The slide is purely to say we do use a much more formal model um, to test this. When we do that and we account for factors which vary at the area level, those that vary at the street segment level, and when we estimate the influence of factors we can't collect data on, we get the same um, conclusion as before. Those street segments that have the highest movement potential are those which have the highest burglary risk associated with them. Now you're probably thinking, okay, that's interesting, this applies to burglary, but what about more serious crime types? So students of mine have looked at a range of crime types. Luthea Summers looked at outdoor street violence. Uh, that paper's just been accepted, so it'll be out shortly. She finds the same kinds of results. Lucene Tarkian looked at drug supply in London and again finds a similar pattern of results. So the utility of, of this approach seems to apply to, wide, to a wider range of crimes than, than residential burglary. Okay, short-term prediction. So the other kind of bow um, to or string to the bow that we've been, we've been doing, is predicting where crimes will happen next. So rather than long-term patterns, where will crime happen tomorrow or over the course of the next week? And we draw on two empirical regularities. I've talked about one already, the fact that some places are more risky than others. The second empirical regularity... Five minutes. <laughs> Sorry, it says time out on there, which was scared me. Um, the second empirical <laughs> regularity is... Uh, near repeat victimization. What this means is, or what we find when we study crime patterns is that when a crime occurs at one location, the risk at that location and nearby is temporarily <laughs> elevated. And that risk diffuses in space, as you can see um, in the graph I'm showing you here. So in the case of residential burglary, the burgled home is at a heightened risk, and then the risk seems to spread down the street. But it also diffuses in time. So within one week, this is the pattern we get. Two weeks later, we get a similar spatial pattern, but the risk has significantly decayed. And there's good reason um, to think that the reason we get these patterns is because of offenders return to the same locations and those nearby. So they're extending their awareness space or learning about these places and going back to those locations for that reason. So if you like, the two regularities give us a sense of this attractiveness surface, which places are typically attractive to offenders, and the finding about near repeats suggests that the risk at those locations will be temporarily boosted when an, an, when an offense has occurred at those locations. So these regularities are really helpful because they can help us to predict where crime might take place next. And in the early work that we did about 12, 15 years ago, we modeled this pattern of near repeat victimization. So if you imagine a crime occurs where that red spot is, what we're saying will happen is that risk will diffuse from that location to those nearby. So the risk will be temporarily elevated at those locations shown, but it will decay over time. And we developed a simple mathematical model just to mimic that pattern. And we compared it to alternative forms of crime mapping that were available at that time. And we showed it to outperform these methods. But consider, we've been talking about the street network. So this model assumes that when a crime takes place at a location like this, risk will diffuse in the following way. So those locations which are shown in the circle will be at an elevated risk after that crime takes place. And our assumption is that's because the offender has learned about the location where they committed a crime and those nearby. But you, I don't really have to labor this point, but it's obvious that not all of those street segments would, be, would feature in the awareness space of an offender after committing crime um, at that X location. So if we consider these locations, for instance, the offender having committed a crime at the X, to gain knowledge of this location would have to travel this very convoluted route around the network. And it seems unlikely that they do that naturally. So what we've attempted to do in this work is to model the flow of risk or diffusion of risk along the network. So this is mimicking the flow of an offender's awareness through the network. So consider these two <laughs> similar maps in front of you, thank you. Um, if we consider that those uh, street segments that are shaded are the street segments on which two different crimes take place. You'll see that they're very close to each other on the maps, but we expect the risk to diffuse differently from them, as I'll, I'll show um, now. So map on the left, we're seeing the risk um, flow through the network, and you see a particular pattern of flow from that location. Now from the other street segment, which is very close to the first one, 
we see a very different pattern of flow of risk through the network. And it's this variation in flow which is dictated by the street network, which we've been trying to harness in, in the work we've been doing recently, and which I'll talk about now. So paper that we've just finished and has just been accepted um, for publication develops the simple method I talked to before, but applies this on a street network. So what we do simply in this model is to generate predictions for a street segment at a given point in time as a function of where crimes have occurred um, in the past. We have um, a spatial kernel um, in this algorithm, so that dictates how far risk spreads either over the course, over a network, or in um, a kind of uh, planar space. And then we have a temporal kernel, which dictates how long the risk from a, a single event persists over time and how that decays over time. Again, I won't go into any um, detail, but just to say that we calibrate um, this model and we do this for a network-based model, which is what I showed you um, in the figures previously, and a grid-based model, which is based on our earlier work. We optimize the models and then we compare their performance to see whether the network model outperforms the simpler uh, planar model. This is an output from um, a street network prediction. And the thing I want you to take from this is what this shows is similar to what I showed you earlier, that there are sharp discontinuities in risk at the street segment level. So it mimics the kinds of patterns that I showed you previously. And kernel density estimates or planar models won't do this. OK, how accurate um, is the model? So what we used, first of all, was we used um, 12 months of data to calibrate the model. And then we did forecasts for every day for a six-month period thereafter. So we use an out-of-sample test. And our question is, is at different coverage levels, which are shown on the x-axis, what fraction of crime can we accurately predict using this model? And the crime used here is, is residential burglary. So what we can see here is for the network model, if we were to, uh, to look at 10% of the most risky street segments, we capture around about 30% of crimes. If we look at the 20% most risky, we're getting around about 55% of crimes. If we compare that to the, what we've labeled the grid-based alternative, we see that's much superior performance. And the grid-based um, alternative is exactly the sort of method which is used in the commercial software with which some of you uh, may be familiar. So what we're showing is with even a simple implementation of the grid-based method, we have superior performance um, from this approach. I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. First, implementation of the network model is better, but there are differences between predictive accuracy and patrol efficiency. So we could more accurately predict where crimes take place, but it, if those street segments are spread out across a large area, it'd be difficult for the police to patrol them. So we also need to optimize patrol efficiency. There's also a big difference between where you put your resources and what you actually do at those locations. And what you do may be context specific, and that requires um, some consideration um, in, in preventive efforts. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, perfect timing, thank you. Um, now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, los siguientes speakers. Um, tenemos Elizabeth Ward, eh, para la Alianza de la, para la Prevención de la Violencia. Con ella va a exponer también Paris Liu Ajay Jr. de la Universidad de las Indias Occidentales Jamaica y van a presentar el tema delito y mapeo de activos para guiar intervenciones comunitarias. Very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have a, a hard act to follow after Shane. I'll try as well. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my first time in Mexico and I'm having a clumsy time. Ah. So, um, the presentation. What we'll be sharing this morning would be uh, how we've used crime and asset mapping together to guide community interventions. There are different scales of how the mapping would work, and it's something that we've tried to apply and something uh, that is very important in terms of our national development in Jamaica. Heather and other presenters yesterday spoke about different uh, studies that have, have been conducted in Jamaica. And one of the very important things we have to understand is the, the importance of and the difference between national scales and subnational scales. But we'll be using GIS and mapping 
uh, to do actual engagements. Everything you'll be seeing this morning is going to be actual data, practical data that's being used right now and has been used for anything ranging from engagement of civic leaders, business leaders, academics, policymakers, and law enforcement. And we integrate many different types of data sets into this equation, not just social data, but also infrastructural data, roads, but also environmental data as well. And this can guide and uh, monitor different funded, funded programs by, by the multilateral organizations or internal private sector foundations and so on. Hotspots, something that I think Laura is going to be speaking about later, Hotspots reveal different patterns and show how our resources can be deployed differently. But again, there are scales to how you apply hotspots and the data that you apply it to. In the case of our social variables, our education pattern in Jamaica is not uniform. Some areas are better educated than others. Some areas have better access to education than others. Areas in Kingston have different levels and rates of unemployment. And this is something that can be revealed to explain the pattern that we're going to see later on. The patterns of churches and schools are important. The relationships between these very important and critical social infrastructure uh, and, and, um, and crime and violence um, show very stark patterns in terms of how intervention can be guided through different civic institutions and what can be done. It also helps us to identify where we would be using and deploying owners of, um, of the solutions that we, we propose. It's not going to be a helicopter approach, a national policy level. It's going to require engagement at a very, very local scale. And we need to zoom in on that. We look at even the fiber optic network in Jamaica. Access to the internet, access to high speed internet. Where are these in relation to crime? Where are these in relation to those schools and churches? where you're going to set up after school programs and whatever. How do you engage the private sector leaders to fund uh, telecommunication activities that can promote education through the internet and the usage of, of, of high-tech um, services? We look at business exclusions. Where are the businesses, the employers located versus where the people live? The red areas show where people live. The dots that are circling the map are where the businesses are. You can see that in, in the areas in red, there are very few businesses, very few employment opportunities. But this will also guide, Shane, the location of transport services. Do buses get into these areas where people are? Do, are people walking on these streets at night to get home? Those areas also correspond to very high crime levels as well. So we get to see the interplay between many different um, features in the, in the system. Now, when you look at operational crime maps, we can see not just the location of gangs, but we can see their political associations and the movements of those gangs. We also can look at different subsections. I call them informal communities, where the people define which is their turf. And this is something that we can define, again, not from a policy level, but it's something where the people define what is their community, and we can use this to guide their own um, engagements. Now we're going into community scale. We're looking at asset mapping. How these collect not just information on the presence or absence of a particular asset, but a building condition, a building type, and specific categories. So you want to know where the vacant lots are versus the, the bar that is in a rundown condition, separate from the bar that's in a good condition. So all of these things are considered when we do this. And I think we've done over two dozen communities. Every single thing, every single light pole, fire hydrant. 52 communities. 52. <laughs> so we have so many different communities that we've, we've assessed, as, uh, asset mapped at different scales and, and all to extremely granular detail. This includes individual houses as well, not just the, the non-residential entities. So these are more examples of the different asset maps. But on the right, you'll see where we've actually done some weighted um, modeling. We show which assets are in worse condition. And there is a direct correlation between asset condition and crime, crimes and crime types. But beyond that, you can also use the asset maps to help guide your 
community intervention. You can look at the, the building condition to target which ones you're going to focus on, but you also want to look at the logistics of how you're going to get in there, access, whether there are other kinds of, 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 of um, physical infrastructure in those areas, like gullies or whatever, that may impede or enhance your, your, um, your intervention and your engagements. But then we want to connect crime, we want to connect the assets, and we want to connect law enforcement. How do we identify where crimes, what types of crimes are occurring? How do you get in there? What do we expect when we get in there? So we're able to look at these things. But to track police responsiveness, we look at how far the police have to travel to get to a particular crime. So on the bottom right, you can see a graph that shows the response times in 2014 versus 2015s by type of crime, by vehicle or transportation method used, by weapon used, and by whether or not these things are gang related or not gang related. Domestic violence has a very random pattern, while, while gang violence have very specific patterns. We can connect this to ballistics forensics. We can trace which gun is used in which crime, how far those crimes are apart. And we're able to inform the police into their own interventions. But when you connect the community asset data to this ballistics information, you know what to expect and what's going on in these areas. Intelligence and response is no longer instinctive and subjective. It is now information based. And then we're able to look at not just where and how far the police go, but in terms of their own service delivery and their ranges of um, response. Areas where you have overlaps of different police station crisscrossing into each other areas talks about whether or not you have operational efficiencies going on within the law enforcement framework. So we've been using the maps to identify and prioritize communities to provide the assets and the background information before you head in there. But also, one of the most gratifying things for me in doing all of this is how the maps facilitate communication between different groups of people. Where you have trust issues between the police and the community, when they're speaking to a common map, it, 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 it flattens that, that um, disconnect. And it's something that has been very impressive. Um, then we also use it to engage fundraising, planning, and program management. And these are how a lot of what we've done um, and continue to do using mapping. So we try to get ahead of the problem. And we look at how cost of care, Professor Shepard, how these things begin to plug into the equation and what we do with this information. So we have done mapping for, of, the, of several major hospitals in Jamaica, looking at where the cases are and which hospital and where the where the where the cases coming to each hospitals are coming from. And this allows us to really get a sense of getting ahead of the problem. Prevention is better than treatment. And we can see for both violence related injuries and road traffic traffic um, accidents, we can see what's going on and the range people travel to get to hospital. Sometimes people die on the way to the hospital because it's so far. Um, with that, I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Ward. Uh, she will wrap up this presentation. Yeah, you have five minutes. OK. Um, really, what we say is when you have this data, what you have to be able to do is to understand that using this data-driven, coordinated, and sustained approach, which is very important, you have to have good community policing and good relationships with the police and the community, and you have to have a supportive political environment for it to last. And what we've seen is once we have the data and we're in the community, that you move through four steps, moving a community from one that has been torn apart by violence and crisis into community building activities and into community development and then community safety and st stability. Um, one or two things to point out is many agencies have to get involved. The Peace Management Initiative, the church, the police, and a lot of the maps that you showed, we showed bring those people on board, train counselors. We find there's a big problem with complex grief. A lot of healing and reconciliation has to go on. 
and a lot of issues of literacy are important and the availability of green spaces. Also, you have to have development. You notice where there's no businesses in these communities. We have to get investment in these communities. And what we find facilitates that is that you get community engagement and peace councils and you build the connections with the business community to get that investment or even the multilateral agencies. So where you start to move towards sufficiency is when you have those um, integrated economic activities occurring. Again, multiple agencies to perform. So the steps involved, engage a whole community. Um, have closed door mediations between people who are having the conflict outside of the community. Make sure you have healing and reconciliation. You have to integrate the borders between the communities and you have to have that grief counseling available. The peace councils have to be democratic and there has to be a method of communication between them and the formal system. And you have to make space for other partners to work. So this is often what has to happen. We use sports, we use transformational workshops, we use income generation, and um, we make sure that there's follow through to do that. Sharing this data with the police, as Paris said, is very important. And um, here we are at different police levels, sharing the information in our crime observatory meetings, but we're probably going to call them public safety labs that we need to ensure occur regularly across the island. This is a kind of impact when we've done these things. And we do have the data sustained out to 2014. And what is very encouraging is that the falls that we've seen here are maintained even in up to today in these communities. Um, and what we're currently trying to do is look at some of the economic analysis, and we'll hear much more about that. But we're starting to look at trying to show how much from what we know it costs us at the hospitals and how much it costs us for a basic um, value for a life as against the cost of the investment. And what is your return? What's your dollar return for this kind of investment? This is it done at a small community level. It was driven by one of the senior medical officers at the hospital in this community. That basic school bill by a development agency was never being used. But the solo was a guy that was shot and had gone. Multi mixed housing methods, um, um, ability in the community. But they set up a community peace council. And um, those are the guys in the t-shirt. One is a pastor, one is just a guy off the road. And the, the old people can enjoy life, play dominoes, have a party. They had a party for us. And actually, we were visited by Leif from Sweden and that. Um, what's important is what spun out of this is the VPA tries to strengthen NGOs in communities already. And you notice this one is called Holy Networks, but as well as him running a little business where he faxes, laminates, he facilitates learning. So it's learning networks, how you learn online to learn. But you learn your life skills up in the hills where there's green grass and blue-green therapy is applied and counseling therapy and learning skills from Adobe and, and video counseling and transforming the lives of some of these guys in these hotspot areas. And trying to link them to opportunities that are economic and give them the ability to earn a decent living. So, so, um, so finally, I just wanted to, to note that um, in this conference, you know, we're all data people here, but it's something that um, we shouldn't forget, at least in Jamaica, why we're doing this. And it's really the investment in the, in the youth, and it's something that has been very rewarding for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Paris. It's, it's been really amazing, the timing that these guys have. Uh, excellent timing. Um, now we have uh, the presentation of uh, Laura Heitman. Um, ella trabaja para el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, el BID, y el tema que va a tocar ella a continuación eh, se titula Concentración Delictiva y Dinámicas de los Puntos de Alta Densidad Delictuales en América Latina. Laura, very much welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to our amazing audience that is here in spite of the hard competition. Um, so I'll talk today about crime concentration in Latin America. As you know, most of the studies on crime patterns are from developed countries, from US, from UK, as we've seen. Um, but today I'll try to show one of the efforts of the IDB in trying to improve the way in which ca we can analyze and study and promote administrative recording of, of, by the police uh, of crime in, in the region. I'll turn to Spanish. We are in Mexico, but my slides are in English as a compromise. So I'll start. Uh, as you know, Latin America and the Caribbean is the most violent region in the world in regional terms. Uh, we have the highest homicides rates. And they've been increasing since desde 2005. Me olvidé cambiar de idioma. Y entonces tenemos un problema en la región. Hay muchas ciudades que han hecho progresos sustanciales. Sin embargo, en términos regionales todavía estamos en una mala situación. Entonces la pregunta es cómo abordar este problema. ¿Sí? Hoy no voy a hablar sobre estrategias de policía, que es otros temas que abordamos en el banco, ni sobre rehabilitación o reinserción de, de privados de libertad. Lo único que voy a hablar hoy, muy eh, en concordancia con la primera presentación de Shane, es sobre la unidad de análisis. ¿sí? La unidad de análisis eh, en la criminología tradicional ha sido la persona. ¿Cuáles son los factores de riesgos de esas personas? Si su familia, si no tiene empleo, si tiene, no tiene educación, si sus comunidades eh, no tienen las redes suficientes para contenerlos, etc. Últimamente, en la literatura de criminología, se ha eh, avanzado hacia el lugar, la importancia del lugar. ¿Qué lugares generan ese, ese tipo de crimen? ¿sí? Esperemos que en ese lugar no pase nada porque es donde estamos ahora nosotros. Igual Mérida es muy segura por las últimas estadísticas que estuve viendo. Entonces, no voy a hacer un juicio de valor sobre cuál es el, el approach que, que corresponde. Supongo que es una, eh, ambos eh, son complementarios. Simplemente el lugar importa, como vimos en la sesión de hoy. Eh, 70% de los, de los papers de criminología empíricos de los últimos 25 años se centraron en la persona y la literatura sobre eh, los patrones, patrones geográficos es, es incipiente y a la que estamos tratando de contribuir todos nosotros. ¿sí? Como ya dijo Jane, la unidad de análisis va a ser eh, de este estudio los segmentos de calle definidos como eh, ambas veredas entre dos intersecciones. Entonces eso es un segmento de calle de aquí enfrente. Eh, o clusters, conjuntos de segmentos de calle. Y básicamente hoy lo que les quiero compartir son los resultados de un estudio que va a estar online en la página del BID eh, el próximo mes, calculo, que trata de contestar tres preguntas en la región que no fueron contestadas antes, sí fueron en otros países desarrollados. ¿Está concentrado el crimen? ¿Ocurre en determinados lugares en las ciudades o está disperso en, en, en toda la ciudad? Si estuviera concentrado, ¿esa concentración es constante a lo largo del tiempo? ¿Siempre está concentrado o hay momentos en que se dispersa, hay momentos en que se vuelve a concentrar? Y la tercera pregunta es, si estuviera concentrado y constantemente a lo largo del tiempo, ¿es en los mismos lugares que está concentrado? Entonces, ¿hay lugares que crónicamente son peligrosos en estas ciudades de la región? Esas son las tres preguntas que vamos a contestar usando datos georreferenciados de crimen, eh, de estadísticas oficiales de la policía, eh, de seis ciudades de la región. Ahí está Zapopan de México, Bogotá, Colombia, Sucre, Venezuela, Belo Horizonte en Brasil, Montevideo, Uruguay y también Port of Spain de Trinidad que acaban de llegar ayer a la noche y van a estar incluidos en la presentación. Hay otras ciudades que están haciendo esfuerzos por georreferenciar los datos. Eh, decidimos estas ciudades para tener representatividad en distintas subregiones de la región y distintos niveles de, de crimen, desde muy altos eh, hasta más bajos. En términos de homicidios, ahí hay eh, países como Uruguay, que son muy bajos, Bogotá, en Colombia o Brasil, tienen tasas más altas, Venezuela. Entonces hay heterogeneidad en cuanto a la, eh, la ubicación y en cuanto a sus niveles de crimen en estas ciudades. ¿sí? Estos datos para 
los que vienen de afuera no son usuales en la región y por eso es importante promoverlos. Así como promovemos las encuestas de victimización, que es una fuente fundamental de información, que la policía genere esta información confiable y que sea también accesible para investigar, eh, es muy importante. Estas ciudades tienen patrones de crimen distintos. Como vemos, el crimen no se distribuye uniformemente, ¿sí? eh, solo para empezar a analizarlas un poquito. Y si pasamos a la primera pregunta sobre si el crimen está concentrado en la región, ¿qué sabemos en otras ciudades? En el mundo desarrollado, eh, esencialmente eh, ciudades de Estados Unidos, hay un, hay un paper del año pasado de Weisburg, un criminólogo muy conocido, que muestra que el 50% del crimen ocurre o se genera en más o menos el 5% de los segmentos de calle. ¿sí? Eh, y el 25% del crimen en aproximadamente 1 o 1,5% de, del, del de los segmentos de calle. Entonces, si uno ordena todas las cuadras, desde las más peligrosas hasta las más seguras, cuando llegamos al 50% de crimen, vemos que solo ocurrieron en 5% de las calles. ¿sí? En, en Inglaterra hay resultados muy similares también, como vimos en la presentación anterior. ¿Qué pasa en las ciudades nuestras de la región? Lo mismo, aproximadamente. ¿sí? El 50% del crimen se concentra aproximadamente en el 4% de, de los segmentos de calle. ¿sí? O sea, es una porción muy pequeña de estas ciudades que genera, de algún modo, el crimen. Y es una, es, es una similitud con el mundo desarrollado, aunque la incidencia del crimen en estas ciudades es muchísimo superior. Uno podría pensar, si hay mucho más crimen, entonces tal vez está en, en más segmentos de calle que en, en el mundo donde las tasas son un sexto o un décimo que en estas ciudades. Y eso no ocurre. Otra cosa importante es que el crimen en muchas de estas ciudades estuvo en aumento y sin embargo eh, sigue siendo concentrado. Si mezclamos los gráficos con las otras ciudades que encontramos datos del mundo desarrollado y las que analizamos acá, las amarillas son las de Latinoamérica y el Caribe, vemos que están mezcladas, ¿sí? no encontramos eh, diferencias en, en este indicador que es la concentración del crimen. Pasando a la segunda pregunta, ¿esa concentración es constante a lo largo del tiempo? Primero, es importante recalcar que no tenemos series de tiempo muy largas. Muchas ciudades recién ahora están haciendo esos esfuerzos de recolectar estos datos georreferenciados. ¿sí? En, en Estados Unidos estos estudios tienen 25 años, tal vez 15 años. Acá tenemos series más cortas. Lo que podemos ver en estas series, la línea roja muestra la concentración del 50% de los delitos, la azul del 25% y la, la verde punteada es la cantidad de incidentes. ¿sí? Lo que vemos es que es bastante constante, tiene algunas fluctuaciones, la escala es muy pequeña, pero si uno los ve en perspectiva serían dos puntos porcentuales más o menos de variación en esa concentración del crimen a lo largo del tiempo. En el trabajo que estamos haciendo, estamos analizando algunas de esas eh, variaciones, por ejemplo, si vemos, a ver, voy a, voy a seguir el ejemplo del amigo Shane, si vemos eh, algunas variaciones que se notan especialmente eh, y las analizamos, vemos que coinciden con reformas policiales, cambios en las estrategias de patrullaje, entonces eso es sumamente importante eh, para analizar. También vemos que importa el tipo de delito. Yo les mostré resultados agregados del crimen en general. Ahora, si uno analiza por delitos, tal vez la historia es otra. Este es el caso de Uruguay, para ponerles de ejemplo, de eh, las lo que en Uruguay se llama rapiñas, que son los robos violentos, que solo en Uruguay se llama así en español, robberies, que vemos que han aumentado muchísimo desde acá eh, su dispersión. ¿sí? ¿Por qué es esto? Justo en ese momento la policía, la jefatura de policía de Montevideo decidió una nueva estrategia de patrullaje enfocada en determinados lugares y como consecuencia acá se ve que se fue dispersando el crimen a, hacia, hacia otros lugares. O sea, en, en, en rangos muy pequeños, pero es como que cuando uno mira a lo largo del tiempo la concentración, es interesante ver que las estrategias que hace la policía importan, influyen más en Latinoamérica y el Caribe que en las series largas de tiempo que se ven en Estados Unidos, donde todo es mucho más estable. La tercera pregunta, que es más interesante, ¿ocurre en los mismos lugares, ahora que establecimos que es más o menos constante a lo largo del tiempo? Acá usamos muchos métodos, 
eh, porque es difícil de contestar esta pregunta metodológicamente, más allá del tema de los datos. Eh, en los distintos métodos, yo les voy a mostrar todas las, las fórmulas y eso las dejo para el trabajo, pero básicamente las conclusiones que llegamos son las mismas. Eh, viendo clusterings de estos segmentos de calle peligrosos a lo largo del tiempo, buscando eh, la transición entre segmentos hot en un momento y cómo fueron cambiando al año siguiente, al otro y al final del periodo, a ver si se mantuvieron hot o no. Eh, también analizamos trajectories, que es una forma que en criminología se usa mucho para contestar específicamente esta pregunta. Lo hicimos en, en, cuando teníamos series de tiempo más largos, porque si no, no tiene sentido. Eh, y también estudiamos para el corto plazo eh, temas de repeats y near repeats, como mostró Shane antes. ¿Qué concluimos? Hay lugares en estas ciudades que son crónicamente peligrosos. ¿sí? Eh, como vemos, por ejemplo, cuando tomamos distintos años, 2007, 2012, o 2009, 2014, hay lugares en Bogotá, en Belo Horizonte y en todas las ciudades que son crónicamente complicados, robustos, a todas las distintas especificaciones y metodologías que uno use. Más o menos el 50% de las calles que eran hot en el primer momento que las analizamos siguieron siendo hot a lo largo del tiempo. ¿sí? Entonces hay una proporción importante del crimen que sigue ocurriendo sistemáticamente en determinados lugares. Y hay otra proporción que se va dispersando en, en determinados otros lugares. Este es un paper de, descriptivo para ver algunos hechos estilizados. En otros trabajos que estamos haciendo, estamos tratando de entender esas dinámicas. Y hay un estudio que van a presentar, calculo que mañana, Carlos y gente de UNODC y de INEGI, sobre estos temas también, que se los recomiendo. Eh, otro tema importante, por ejemplo, les, les pongo de nuevo un ejemplo de Montevideo. Si vemos 2006, 2014, para crimen en total, vemos que estos, son como, estos polígonos muestran clusters de, clusters de segmentos de calle complicados, que tienen una alta concentración de crimen. ¿sí? Vemos que hay como una diagonal que parece bastante peligrosa, que se mantiene a lo largo del tiempo. Si uno dibuja todos los segmentos de calle, y en rojo están los que... Todos los años, en un periodo de 10 años, tuvieron más crímenes que eh, la mediana. Y entonces, si en, en un año tengo más crímenes de la mediana, pongo 1 y así sumo a 10. Rojo sería 10. 0 sería el verde, donde no hay crímenes más, eh, en, en, más que la mediana en todos estos años. Vemos que hay lugares que por toda la ciudad que son rojos, que, que son segmentos de calle que todos los años eh, fueron con una alta incidencia delictiva. Si hacemos un zoom podemos ver que uno pierde la noción que uno tal vez tenía de que hay barrios complicados o zonas complicadas, sino que pareciera que hay segmentos de calles complicados, peligrosos en, en toda la ciudad. De hecho, si uno muestra esa diagonal que parecía tan difícil antes, tan, con clusters de crimen, vemos que adentro de esta diagonal incluso hay calles muy seguras. ¿sí? Otra cosa que vemos cuando vemos si ocurre sistemáticamente en los mismos lugares es que también qué tipo de delitos importa. ¿sí? Si bien en Montevideo veíamos una diagonal muy importante de clusters de segmentos de calle con crimen, eh, si miramos eh, robos, vemos por ejemplo que acá había una gran concentración, sin embargo, luego no hay más y otros lugares aparecieron. ¿sí? Esto también tiene que ver con una intervención policial que hubo, hubo atrás, que se concentró en este lugar, que es la, la zona del, del mercado del puerto, para los que conocen, y si no les recomiendo que es muy lindo, te digo. Eh, y, y bueno, hubo como una estrategia de saturación que puede llegar a haber causado algún desplazamiento a otras zonas porque coincide con zonas donde esos ofensores eh, más cerca de ahí vivían, puede ser. Entonces, otro tema que hicimos en el estudio es para ver en el corto plazo la revictimización en el tiempo y en el espacio. ¿sí? Entonces vimos, les sigo con, con Montedio, está, está para todas las ciudades que analizamos, la probabilidad de que si hubo un delito en determinado lugar, en determinado momento, vuelva a haber otro de 0 a 15 días, de 16 a 30, etc. Y en esa misma lugar o cerca en la próxima cuadra, en la otra, en la otra, ¿sí? Y encontramos en general para todas las ciudades este patrón en el tiempo de revictimización en ese lugar o en los lugares vecinos. Y ¿sí? esto indica que es un 57% más probable de que ocurra de nuevo 
un robo residencial de 0 a 15 días en el lugar donde ya ocurrió. ¿sí? Esto es para hurtos, que es un 22% más probable, y en las cuadras eh, siguientes también, rojo es estadísticamente significativo en esta tabla. Y esto se cumple para todas las ciudades. Entonces, en el corto, si bien en el largo plazo vimos bastante desplazamiento y dinámicas de crimen, en el corto plazo vemos que hay un patrón de revictimización eh, importante ¿sí? en las ciudades. Entonces, terminando, tres preguntas importantes tratamos de contestar hoy. Primero, ¿está concentrado el crimen en estas ciudades? Si está concentrada, esa concentración es constante y si es en los mismos lugares. La evidencia de estas seis ciudades de Latinoamérica y el Caribe es la primera vez que se analizan ciudades de distintos países de América Latina y el Caribe, que requirió un esfuerzo muy grande de datos y le agradezco a todos los que ayudaron desde el Centro de Excelencia en Inegi, eh, de UNODC, a Heather, a José Antonio, a los Ministerios de Seguridad, Ministerio de Interior de Brasil, de Uruguay, porque fue un esfuerzo muy grande. Con esos datos que pudimos conseguir, pudimos ver que efectivamente el crimen está muy concentrado en las ciudades de Latinoamérica y del Caribe aproximadamente igual que en los países desarrollados, validando esta ley de concentración del crimen que parece que ocurría en el mundo desarrollado y también ocurre acá. Es una, dentro de tantas diferencias que tenemos, no sé si es bueno o malo, pero en esto nos parecemos. Es constante a lo largo del tiempo, bastante constante, sin embargo es mucho más sensible a las reformas policiales y a las intervenciones que lo que parecen mostrar los estudios del de, eh, mundo desarrollado. Y hay heterogeneidad por tipos de crimen. Esto algunos estudios no lo miran, pero es importante porque las estrategias de la policía en general se, se ocupan de algún tipo de crimen en, en especial. ¿sí? Y por otro lado, ocurre en los mismos lugares o no ocurre, vemos que hay lugares crónicamente peligrosos, como un 40-50% de los lugares son siempre peligrosos en, en los datos a lo largo del tiempo y sin embargo hay bastante dinámica en, en la otra proporción del crimen. Y esto parece ser distinto también que el mundo desarrollado, donde hay mucha más estabilidad en los lugares eh, que son crónicamente difíciles. ¿sí? También vemos desplazamiento del crimen potencialmente en el mediano y largo plazo, probablemente como respuesta a eh, intervenciones de la policía. Y en el corto plazo vemos un patrón y una estructura de revictimización en el tiempo y en el espacio bastante importante en estas ciudades. ¿sí? Todo esto tiene implicancias de política muy importante, solo algunas. Primero, importa la geografía, importa el espacio, importa eh, los lugares donde se genera de algún modo crimen. Como vimos en Montevideo y como mostró Jane para Inglaterra, una calle puede ser hot, y la de al lado puede ser súper safe. Entonces, hay algo que está pasando ahí, es importante para nuestras investigaciones ver por qué se generan esos lugares, anticiparnos a cuando ocurra alguna intervención ahí, a qué otros lugares potencialmente podrían irse eh, esos criminales, esos delitos, ¿sí? y qué políticas podemos hacer para que no se genere ese desplazamiento que podría estar ocurriendo. Esas son otras investigaciones que también tenemos en el BID en marcha. Segundo, tenemos similitudes con con eh, el mundo desarrollado y también algunas diferencias, como les eh, mostré. Y esto es importante cuando exportamos, adaptamos o adoptamos eh, algunas políticas de otros países. Entonces, entender, tener estos datos es muy importante para poder ajustar y adaptar mejor estas recomendaciones de un cuerpo de literatura muy grande que otros países ya construyeron y nosotros tenemos que construir. La concentración del crimen es sensible al accionar de la policía y entonces es importante tener esto en cuenta cuando uno ve desplazamientos, que ve qué va a pasar en el largo plazo, etc. Y finalmente, la estructura del crimen importa. Entonces, si uno entiende y estudia estos patrones de revictimización en el, en el mismo lugar, en los vecinos, esto lleva a varias implicancias en cuanto al uso de técnicas como predictive policing, que está muy de moda, eh, a tratar de fortalecer... Las, eh, las unidades de análisis criminal de nuestros países, de las policías. Entonces, tener estos datos es muy importante y creo que esta es, es una audiencia muy oportuna para promover en todos nuestros países que es muy rico todo lo que uno puede aprender de tener datos confiables de la policía, más allá de otras fuentes, porque todo esto es solamente una pequeña porción del, del delito que ocurre, pero es una porción relevante que es la que la policía en general usa para actuar es la que tenemos más con más periodicidad 
y es importante seguir fortaleciéndola. Así que les agradezco mucho. Eh, cualquier duda, mis datos de contacto están ahí y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Laura, muy interesante. Eh, efectivamente son los primeros esfuerzos que estamos realizando en América Latina al respecto de geografía del crimen, normalmente habíamos tenido muchas limitaciones de información, teníamos los métodos, sabíamos usar las cosas, pero no teníamos información válida o útil que pudiéramos eh, aplicar para estos estudios, no, son estudios que para nosotros son realmente muy, muy novedosos. Tengo entendido que hay dos preguntas eh, y abriríamos entonces el espacio a, a estas preguntas. Eh, eh, tenemos una pregunta para, de hecho para Laura, eh, voy a tratar de leerla, la dispersión del crimen, la pregunta es, la dispersión del crimen fue idéntica al incremento del delito, ¿por qué atribuirlo al policiamiento en Montevideo? Sí, eh, la, la dispersión del de crimen no necesariamente fue, fue idéntica al, al delito, tal vez hay un tema de, de escalas ahí. De hecho, el crimen en, en Montevideo ha venido subiendo, especialmente los robos con violencia, pero se ha, mantenido, se ha, se ha contenido en los últimos años con varios esfuerzos de policía. Tal vez, eh, les, les hablé un poco más de esto porque estamos también haciendo evaluaciones de estas intervenciones de la policía, en determinados lugares, entonces tengo como más inside information para, para contarles sobre este tema. Pero sí, eh, en algunas intervenciones puntuales lo que pasó fue al revés, lo que en la literatura se llama diffusion of benefits, que no se desplazó, sino que se, en un lugar bajó y alrededor también bajó. Pero lo que estamos viendo es que en un periodo de tiempo más largo, si uno mide desplazamiento, en otros lugares parece haber ap aparecido y puede tener que ver con... La, que se apagaron determinados puntos calientes que antes había. ¿sí? Um, thank you. Now I have a question for the panel. Whoever wants to take this question, I will translate it. It says that uh, for compiling of data, uh, normally in geography of crime you use official data from government institutions, etc. Uh, have you been able to use other sources such as uh, victimization surveys in this analysis, spatial analysis? I'll start. Um, just, just quickly, the, um, on the concentration of crime at the street segment and area level, the slide I showed from the, uh, the Nigerian case study was a, a micro-level survey, so about 3,000 households in a relatively small area. We did that in that context because the police data, first of all, aren't available, and also under-reporting rates are so high that we, we figured it wouldn't be the, a meaningful way to do this. So. But the challenge of, of using surveys is that you have to do them at the micro level of places. And, and that's difficult because most surveys are done at a national scale to get nationally representative samples. So you have to do this specifically for this purpose. And I think we have to do more work on geocoding of our national surveys. I think there is a great, um, we've been able to do it in the hospitals to get that Um, address of the location of injuries and that's why but when we do our surveys there, that GIS coding ability is not usually incorporated so that makes our work much more difficult and one final question also for the panel um, it says it's a methodological question is it says that the geographical patterns of crime are not random what implications do these uh, non-random patterns have in a statistical analysis Um, because it says that it, this implies that uh, the assumption of randomness that the data and analysis are requiring are not uh, being fulfilled. What implications would this have then? Well, one of the things that the, the non-randomness has, uh, it has two, two, two things, one on statistics and one on operations. Um, because when you look at the, the scale of the stats, if it's going to be national scale, sub-national scale, sub-sub-national scale, you're going to have different implications and conclusions coming from the data. But from an operational standpoint, I'm talking about from police high command, um, ministerial policy level, um, these things, it's, it's very important not to broad brush a problem and a solution. Uh, it's, it's important to scale it down to the local information, and that's where the, the asset information or whatever within 
a local um, um, regime can, um, can help to refine uh, a broad policy into something as specific. And I think one of the things that we have to think on on a broader scale is that these things are related to development. In other words, there 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 are characteristics within these communities that um, are there, and there are certain things that accelerate the level of crime according to different things. But those characteristics are just waiting for the you know to be dealt. We have to intervene and uh, at a development level, not just at a crime control level. Desde el punto de vista de cuando uno utiliza estos datos y, por ejemplo, quiere cruzarlos con otras variables y quiere hacer análisis econométricos, hay determinadas técnicas econométricas para tener en cuenta esta autocorrelación temporal o espacial y ajustar, por ejemplo, los errores y es toda una, una ciencia que, que está desarrollada para justamente eso. Um, yeah, the other, I think Part of, I think there are a number of dimensions to this question. I think one of them is about the assumption of uh, independence in the data. I think that might be one of the things that was being asked. Um, and if you use regular statistical techniques, you violate the assumptions, which leads to errors of inference. Um, and for that reason, uh, I think Laura, if I understood the correction, that sorry, the translation was, was pointing to um, to those issues. So there are sets of techniques in spatial econometrics which have been developed to, to deal with these issues. Um, also, a lot of the work we do, you'll have seen on the, on the graphs that I use that, that are dotted lines all over the place. Um, th these come from kind of Monte Carlo simulation methods where we, we use totally different, uh, well, not totally different, but different techniques where we don't make the same assumptions. And some of the analyses that Laura was showing as well would we'll, we'll draw on those sorts of uh, methods to address those problems. So it's, it's a it's the right question, and I thank you very much for asking it, whoever that was. Yeah, luckily now we have good software, because I remember when we were studying and doing all these spatial analysis, we would have to make some miracles to do, to do these things. Um, actually, we're running on time, but we have one more question uh, that is directed to Elizabeth. And uh, the question is, how do you access gang, uh, data on gang activity? This comes because we have a good working relationship with the police and also with the community. So we have gotten, we use a lot of the policing data that's available and then we validate it with community information. So we've done qualitative work, youth violence and organized crime, a, a research project that we did for IDRC, which is online, looks at the qualitative approach that we use in addition, but it's good working relations and helping, I find when we give the police what they want and help them to do their job better, you get cooperation. And we also have a signed MOU with the government that allows us to get the data to be able to do this level of analysis. And that level of trust and um, is what is important and official level of trust is important in that process. Okay, well, we are actually on time. I understand that we're going to give a certificate or a diploma to the people in the panel, or we shall probably, shall we? Can I just echo, sorry, can oh, I just echo uh, Laura's uh, comment? Thank you very much for coming to our session, and I'm sure it was much better than the other one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, and uh, a big applause for the panel. Laura.